we're uh, reinventing time sharing. <laughs> and it's true in a certain sense, we are. We're just reinventing time sharing for the internet era. And with time sharing, or with cloud computing, you're very dependent on the service provider, the cloud provider. You have to trust the cloud provider to manage their systems well, to keep them secure, and to have good practices with respect to their employees, to background check their employees, do security checks on their employees, monitor their employees, to have separation of duty. Because effectively what you've done is to outsource all of your IT, all your data center operations, at least for the things you put in the cloud, to the cloud provider. So you're dependent on them. Now there's an old Russian saying, or at least so it's said, trust but verify. And that's a good practice. Yes, you have to trust your cloud provider, but you also want the ability to verify what your cloud provider is telling you. So if they're telling you, you know, we've got five nines of uptime, you want to be able to have somebody else certifying, you know, yeah, we check them periodically, and they do. They've got five nines, or however many nines they say they have. Um, if they say that they're uh, managing their system securely, you want to be able to monitor that yourself, or have an independent third party who monitors that. And TPM provides a way to have that automated, automated monitoring of exactly what's running on those cloud providers' systems. So trust but verify in the cloud as everywhere else. So we've talked about the features that are included by the TPM. They're as relevant or more relevant on the server as they are on the client. Now what about storage? Well, all the guess. I think the security needs to be built into storage. But what does that mean for a storage device? It means what's called a self-encrypting drive. This is like full disk encryption in hardware. And all of the drive manufacturers are already shipping these drives or will be soon. They've been shipping from some manufacturers for several years now. So what is a self-encrypting drive? This is a hard drive that includes encryption in the drive, encryption hardware in the drive. Whenever data is stored to the drive, it's encrypted before it is written to the drive. And when it comes back off, of course, it's decrypted, otherwise it wouldn't do you any good. But the great thing about that is that if somebody steals or discovers your hard drive, it's left in a taxi, in a hotel room, on a table, whatever, whether it's a hard, uh, a hard drive, a flash drive, USB, you know, whatever the form factor, if it's a self-encrypting drive, then your data is protected. Your data is encrypted. And the guy who gets the drive really gets nothing but a drive. They don't get to access your data because they don't know your decryption key. Now, I have one in my laptop that I got a couple of years ago when they were just rolling off of the assembly lines. I was very excited about it. Why was I excited about it? I was excited because now I can go to dinner and I don't have to take my laptop with me everywhere. Being a paranoid security guy, I used to do that. Who oh, don't want anybody? Um, of course, taking it, your laptop to dinner doesn't make it any more secure because some, somebody could take it from you while you're at dinner. But the bottom line from a corporate perspective, from an organizational perspective, is that if you have any storage devices that leave your premises, you should make sure that those storage devices are encrypted, that all the data on there is in encrypt, encrypted form. You can do it with software, you can do it with hardware. Doing it with hardware is obviously more secure, and these days not much more expensive. Um, but you've got to make sure that any data off-site is encrypted, because otherwise you're just laying yourself wide open for trouble, because it's inevitable. There's just a certain percent chance that it's going to happen and eventually it's going to happen to you that one of those unencrypted drives or unencrypted tapes is going to fall into the wrong hands you're going to have a real disaster on your hands. You know, the funny thing is it doesn't even have to fall into the wrong hands. This isn't actually funny, but the unfortunate thing, it doesn't have to fall into the wrong hands. If you've lost it, or one of your employees has lost a drive that has your customer database on it, you're in a deep sea of pain and suffering and your CEO is it, or your CIO is going to have to make some public statements or, you know, I mean, the whole thing is going to come out. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be happy. People are going to be asking questions, why wasn't that encrypted? So, uh, give, cut yourself a break and 
Make sure that the data is encrypted if it's going off-site. Um, the other thing that this gives you is the ability to authenticate or determine whether the data has been modified while it was off-site. But encryption is really the key. And now we get on to my favorite topic, which is networking. Um, and I'm a networking guy, obviously. Uh, and what I want to talk about here is how you can build the security into the network as well. Now, we all think that we have security built into our network because we've all got firewalls, right? Or VPNs or something like that. And that's it. You know, that's just the cat's meow. Well, I have to tell you that's about 10 years ago that was the cat's meow in terms of network security. That was the greatest thing. Um, but we've moved on. <laughs> uh, the world has evolved. Um, and each of those security technologies, whether it's VPNs or firewalls, has its limitations built in. And there are a lot of things that we can do now that we couldn't do 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when those technologies were originally designed. So let's move on together and look at what we can do, not to get rid of our firewalls or our VPNs, but to make them better and to get more for our money if we're going to be buying and installing and managing firewalls and VPNs and intrusion detection and all these other security devices. And the key here is coordination. There's this standard or set of standards called Trusted Network Connect that I've been working on for the last five years. Um, we actually brought our first standards out four years ago and we've added some since then. And basically it gives you the ability to authenticate users however they come into your network, to health check their devices if that's something that you want to do, and then to monitor their behavior to make sure it's consistent with your policies. Now you've probably all got policies already on the books about who is allowed to connect to the corporate network, what sort of devices they're allowed to connect, and what they're allowed to do while they're on the network. So you've already got those policies in place, right? Probably. Written them, and then they sit in a web page somewhere or in a file cabinet. There's no way to enforce them. Uh, this gives you a way to enforce them in an automated manner using the technologies that you already have today, whether that be wireless uh, or wired network uh, switches, uh, whether it be uh, firewalls or VPN gateways. This gives you the ability to use those techniques that you already have, those technologies you already have, to a greater level of capability. Instead of a firewall just checking IP addresses and deciding which traffic to let through on that basis, it's much better for the firewall to be identity aware and to provide exactly the right level of access for each particular user based on their role in the organization. So that the security admin gets a different level of access from the guy in shipping or the finance person gets a different level of access from the engineer. They each need to access different services, different servers, different parts of the network, and you're, you want to allow for that, and you want to manage that, but you don't want to do it on an IP address port basis, because that is not your business policy. Your business policy is based on users and groups and groups of resources. That's the sort of thing that you want to be working with identities, not IP addresses. So by giving you the ability to gather all this information, to share it among your security devices, and then to perform enforcement based on it, TNC is really about coordinating security. And just to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, that's conceptually your TNC uh, server here, or metadata access point as we sometimes call it which allows you to share information. You want to be able to share information not just among your network security components, although that's certainly valuable, but you also want to be able to gather information and share information from your client-side security, your server-side security, and your storage security eventually, so that all of this information is shared in one place, one database. And each of the systems that gathers that information and share what it knows with the others. For example, perhaps your VPN software or a device knows 